Go ahead and take your Bibles this evening and uh, turn them to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter number 7, Matthew chapter number 7 this evening. It's a good crowd on Wednesday night, amen. I did not lay out because it was too hot, amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 7, we're going to be all over the Bible tonight, so have your Bibles ready, Uh, may have you flipping a lot. We'll try to have everything up on the screen for you. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, and uh, we'll want to begin reading in verse number 1. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer this evening. Father, we come to you once again tonight, thanking you, Lord, for uh, just the privilege to be back in the house of God. God, you know we need you tonight. God, you know I need your help as I preach your word tonight. God, I pray you'd give me clarity of speech. God, I pray you'd help us all tonight to to open up our hearts. God, this is a message, Lord, that applies to every single individual in this building. God, help us to take it serious tonight. God, help us not to take it as as being for the person beside us or being for someone that's not here. But God, help us to take it personal. And Father, we'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Judge not. How many of you have ever heard somebody say that before? Only a couple people. Man, we ain't living in the same world. Amen. I've heard a lot of people say that. How many of you have ever heard somebody say that who didn't go to church? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. This is a statement that many unbelievers will use when a believer refers to their lifestyle or the lifestyle of someone that they love as a sin. They'll use this statement many times. But the truth is, I want you to get this, the statement, judge not, is never seen in the scripture by itself. Understand that. Thank you, Brother Mike. God bless you. Amen. I take back all the mean things I said about you before. Amen. (laughs) Praise the Lord. You never find those two words, judge not, by themselves in scripture. Uh, There are verses that make the statement, judge not. We just read one. We see that. But there are also verses that make the statement, go not. Certainly. There are verses that make the statement, be not. There are verses that make the statement, speak not. But does that mean that we are to never go? We're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Absolutely. There are some places that we shouldn't go. Absolutely. Proverbs chapter 4, 14 tells us that we should go not in the way of evil men. Certainly we know that. But does speak not mean that we should never speak? We know the answer to that. No, because we're told to speak the truth in love. Titus, in Titus 2, 15, Paul tells Titus to speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. You see, the key to every Bible principle, and to every Bible doctrine is context. That's the key. But what you find in in many churches today is that many Christians have heard unbelievers quote verses out of context, and unbelievers are dictating the way they live their lives. And instead of studying the Bible themselves, they're just doing what they've heard. There are people that actually think That cleanliness is next to godliness is in the Bible. It's not. That's not the scripture. 
Neither is God helps those who help themselves. That's not in Scripture. Uh, neither, nor is the Lord moves in mysterious ways His wonders to perform. No, nor is uh, a little drummer boy. No, nor is three wise men. It's not. Nor is Adam and Eve ate an apple. You don't find, you don't find that, but oftentimes we've seen that and heard that so much, oftentimes we think that that must be true. So what does the Bible have to say about judging? Well, though unknown to many, it has more verses than Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 1. What the Bible actually teaches is that there are certain things that we should judge, but there are other things that we shouldn't. So before we dive into these this evening, we need to look at what judging or passing judgment actually means. It means to come to an ultimate conclusion. Understand that. That's what judging does. You're coming to an ultimate conclusion. Or, or you're, you're distinguishing between right and wrong when you judge something. And, and if you know your Bible, you know there are times when we must distinguish between right and wrong. The Bible tells us to do that. In fact, if you look in the very next verse of Matthew chapter 7 after verse 5, you have to judge to do what that says to do. You have to judge that which is holy. You have to judge that which is dog. By the way, that's not talking about actual animals there. That's talking about certain types of people in verse number 6. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 15. Y'all still with me? Amen. Just making sure. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Let me ask you this question. Does God desire that we all live spiritual lives? Absolutely. I'll answer that for myself. God desires, God desires that we live spiritual lives. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Get this. Being zealous does not make you spiritual. Being bold does not make you spiritual. Being faithful does not make you spiritual. But being spiritual will make you zealous. And being spiritual will make you bold. And being spiritual will make you faithful. So it starts with your spiritual condition and it comes out from that. You're not going to be anything without the Spirit of God. You can try as hard as you want to live for God, but unless you're filled with the Spirit, unless He's working through you, you're not going to be what you need to be. I don't care how long you've been saved. You need to be filled with the Spirit, and you need to allow Him to work through your heart and out of you. That's, how God, that's, how the, that's where the light's at, folks. That's where the light's going to be seen. So, we must be spiritual. And as we're going to see this evening, part of the judging is knowing when to judge and not to judge. The Bible says, he that, he, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. So sometimes a part of that is knowing when you should judge and when you should not judge. So this evening, I want us to look at three types of judgment that we deal with, if not every day, then every week. Number one, this is the biggest one, and this is the one we fell out the most, personal judgment. Personal judgment. And this is what Matthew chapter 7 is all about. That, that, that's the context of what's going on in Matthew chapter 7. If you look at this passage in its context, y'all bear with me, I need you to look at your Bibles good, okay? What Jesus is saying is make sure that your sins are dealt with before you worry about other people's sins. That, that's, what he's, that's the context of this. Let's read it again one more time. Judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out, out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Notice the first two words of verse number 5. This is very important to understand the context of what's going on. Thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote 
out of thy brother's eye. So the first two words of verse number 5 of Matthew 7 give us the context of this verse. Thou hypocrite. Now, that word hypocrite or hypocrites is nothing new if you look at the Sermon on the Mount. By the way, that's where Matthew chapter 7 is. Jesus is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. If you look back to the previous chapter in Matthew chapter 6, what you'll find, specifically in verse number 2 of Matthew chapter 6, if you look back at that, you'll, in verse number 5 of Matthew chapter 6, and in verse number 16 of Matthew chapter 6, he, he used the term as the, hypocrite, as the hypocrites. In all three of those verses, he says, as the hypocrites. So understand this. In those verses in Matthew chapter 6, he was not necessarily talking to people who were living hypocritical lives, but he was teaching people who had a lack of knowledge of Scripture. But here in chapter 7, and what he's doing in chapter 6, he's telling them, don't live like those Pharisees. Don't live like those scribes. Like they Don't do it like they do it. They do it for an outward show. They do it to be seen of men. He says, don't, don't pray like the hypocrites. Don't live a spirit, don't live a Christian life like the hypocrites. That's what he's saying there in Matthew chapter 6. But here in chapter 7, it's almost like he turns his head. He turns his head from those who have a, a lower knowledge of Scripture, and he turns to the scribes and the Pharisees, and he begins to focus on them. He is clearly referring to people who are doing things in a hypocritical manner in Matthew chapter 7. Because he goes from as the hypocrites to thou hypocrite. You see the difference there? And so the judge not that you be not judged is to the individual who is judging everyone else, but they're, not, but they're forgetting to judge their own lives and their own hearts. They're conveniently overlooking their own life. And he says to them specifically, you don't need to judge because you're not judging correctly. And then he says, that same judgment that you are passing on others, that same measuring stick that you use for the lives of others, is the same measuring stick that you are going to be judged by. Now, what was happening? is that the Pharisees at this time were using God's law to prove that everyone else was wrong. That's what they were doing. And that everyone else was living in sin. And that everyone else was falling short of a righteous life. But yet, they were committing adultery inwardly. They were lusting after women inwardly. They were murdering inwardly by, having that, that, by being angry without a cause. We see that in the previous chapters. They were teaching that there was all kinds of ways to giving a writing of divorcement. Man, they divorce a woman in a second over anything. If they, here, here's what they believe. If you find a woman who looks better than your wife, you have a right to divorce her. They believe that. To divorce her. If she, if she pulls down her hair in public, you have a right to divorce her. If, she, if you see her talking to another man, you have a right to divorce her. That's, that's the way they were living. The Pharisees were judging themselves by their own laws, by the traditions of men, but they were judging everyone else by God's laws. And Jesus said, no, that's not the way it's going to work. You're going to be judged by the same judgment you're judging them by. That same measuring stick that you use for everybody else is the same measuring stick that I'm going to use for you. That's the context of this passage. Just in the wake, good. So, how does this apply to me? How does this apply to Lee Franklin in 2019? How does this apply to you? If I stand up here, bear with me, if I stand up here and preach against homosexuality and yet live in adultery, I'm being a hypocrite. Are y'all with me? If I stand up here and preach against stealing and yet I lie and steal myself, then I am a hypocrite. I'm holding, I'm holding other people to a higher standard than I hold myself to. And Jesus is saying, that's not right. He's calling them out on it. He was saying, you hypocrites, you need to stop judging because you're doing it improperly. You're being prejudiced in your judging. Notice verses 3 through 5. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam 
that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So Jesus says, understand this. He says, your sin impairs your spiritual vision. That's what he's saying right there. When it comes to the sins of others, when you have sin in your life, you're not going to look at them correctly. That's what he's saying there. He says, you can't, you can't see the sins of others clearly because of your own sin. Your beam, by the, that beam beam's a big log, a moat, a little spe, speck of sawdust, that's what it is. He says, your beam of pride will cause you to look at the moats of others incorrectly. If you have a pride problem, you're not going to look at the sins of others correctly. By the way, from time to time, we all have pride problems. We do. Your beam of bitterness will cause you to judge the motes of others incorrectly. Your, your beam of guilt will cause you to judge the motes of others incorrectly. People who carry guilt around all the time are miserable people. And they don't like other people. I've noticed that. They don't. There's some people who don't like people. You ever met them before? They don't. They don't like anybody. They don't like their mama. They don't like their daddy. They don't like their kids. There's people like that in this world. And so when it comes to judgment... I need to spend most of my time in my own heart, in my own life, cleaning my own house. Because from time to time, it gets dirty. Yes, it does. It gets filthy from time to time. My mind gets a little tainted from time to time. Yours does too. Don't judge me. But here's the thing. Before I can look at and if I could, before I can look at and help other people around me, I need to clean myself up first. And by the way, that's what Jesus says in this passage. He says in verse 5, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then, then. We ignore those words. Most people only know verse number 1. They don't want to read the rest of it. So you have to understand the context. So, understand this. We'll get, we'll get to the second part in a second. This has nothing to do with calling sin, sin. So, we see this is a personal judgment. Number two, public judgment. Public judgment. This is the judgment outside of my own personal life. This is the judgment that I have to make when I choose who I'm going to date. Before me and my wife got together, I, I, hate to, I had to judge her. I had to judge whether we should date or not. I had to judge, is, does she love God? I had to judge her for that. Does she go to church? I had to judge her for that. Does she read her Bible? I had to judge her for that. Is she honest? I had to judge her. Can I trust her? I had to judge her. I judged her a lot. I hope you don't feel offended by that. You did too. So you have, before you marry somebody, you have to judge them to see, are they the right one? You have to make judgment decisions. If you're going to choose good friends, you're going to have to judge some people. You're going to have to do that. This is the judgment that I have to use when I'm looking for a church. Does that church preach the Bible? Does, does, that, does that church, uh, are, are they biblically correct in their operations? Are they, are they biblically correct in their doctrines? I have to judge a church to find that out. We all do it. And we should do it, by the way. But the key verse, and I believe this is the key verse in judging in all the Bible. The key verse in judging in all the Bible is John chapter 7 and verse number 24. And this is what Jesus said. Judge not according to the, the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You, say, you hear that? Jesus said to judge righteous judgment. That's not, that's not me. I didn't, Jesus said that. So this verse, he, he says, there's a wrong way to judge, but there's a right way to judge. The wrong way to judge is to allow your eyes to be the judge. That's, the, that's judging by appearance. So if judging with just our eyes is the wrong way, what's the right way? What's the righteous way? How can I judge righteous judgment? What is righteous judgment? Psalm 33, 4 says, for the word of the Lord is right. The word of the Lord is right. 
So God says the correct way to judge is judge according to the Word of God. That's proper judging. The Word of God is not prejudice. It makes it just as wrong for me to do it as it is for you to do it. It does that. Well, on the other hand, if I was the judge, or if you were the judge, and if, we, if, if our eyes were the measuring stick when it comes to right and wrong, we may look the other way on our sins, because we, we, we knew what we were going through. You know, you just don't understand what I'm facing. You don't understand what I'm going through right now. You know, it's not that big of a deal. But if somebody else is doing the same thing, how, they're wicked. They're backslid. They're compromising. That's what happens when we use our eyes as the measuring stick and we don't use God's Word as the measuring stick. We give ourselves a break and we're hard on everybody else. We give our children a break. We give our family a break. We give our mama a break. Amen. We all do it. Here's the thing. I may think that about myself and, and you may think that about yourself and every single person in this building may, may agree with me about what I think about myself. But you know what? The Word of the Lord is right. The Bible is the final authority. God's Word is right. I'm not always right. You're not always right. But God's Word is always right. In fact, understand this. We are never right unless we're lining up with God's Word. We never are. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 1. This is, a, this is a type of judging. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Understand this. He says, try the spirits. Now, when I try something, that means I take it to trial. I'm trying it. And I judge whether it's right or whether it's wrong. Now, do I judge it based on my personal feelings? No, I, I judge it based on what the Word of God says. That's an example. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. says this, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. When you prove something, you put it to the test. And, and we do these things every day. We prove things every day. If you go buy a gallon of milk at the grocery store, you check the expiration date. I hope you do. I've made some bad mistakes not doing it before. Sometimes chocolate milk's older than others. I don't know if people don't buy it as much. I've made some mistakes with chocolate milk more than I have with white milk. But, but here's the thing. You, you check the expiration date. When you check the expiration date, you know what you're doing? You're judging. You're judging. If you go to a red light, you judge whether it's red, yellow, or green. You make a judgment decisions. When you go to the car lot and you go to buy a new car, and they try to sell you a car that's all beat up like, like a brand new car price, and you say, man, you're cheating me. That's wrong. You're judging. Right then. And we would do it. Would you all agree that's the right thing to do? Absolutely. When you look at someone and get mad because they call what the Bible calls a sin and you say you shouldn't judge, you just judge them. You did. By accusing someone of judging, you were judging them. You had to make a judgment decision as to whether they're judging or not. This is good. Are y'all confused yet? Amen. The question is, are you judging righteous judgment? There are things in the public eye that we should judge. Absolutely. We should judge our politicians. We should. When it comes time for us to vote, we must ask ourselves the question, does this individual stand for what is biblically right? Because what's right? The word of the Lord is right. So the next time that you agree with the Bible about something and somebody tells you to judge not, tell them to stop judging you. We can do that. Number three, this is, our, this is the meat tonight. You could, we could call this a perspective judgment or a, a preferential judgment, however you want to put it. Either one of the P's you want to use. There are some things that the Bible does not mention. Do you all know that? If you don't, you hadn't read your Bible. But yet, we, we still know they're wrong. The Bible does not mention using four-letter words. It doesn't. it doesn't. It doesn't tell us that. But anyone who desires to serve God would agree that we shouldn't speak that way. I get an amen right there. I ain't got but a couple. 
There are principles such as Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. We can apply that to that verse. That's a biblical principle there. The Bible does not, does not mention using meth. It doesn't. But the Bible tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's a biblical principle that we can apply to that situation. We are to become instruments of righteousness, not instruments of addiction. Certainly, we know that. But there are things that are not as clear cut as that. And if you look in Romans chapter 14, this is what Romans chapter 14 mainly deals with in this passage. You could call it the personal convictions chapter, I guess you could say. Five different times in Romans 14, Paul uses the term judge or judgest. Notice what he says in verse number 1. Romans chapter 14 and verse number 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth, or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So that in every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, okay, y'all thinking, what in the world is going on? What is happening in this passage? One believer in this passage has this particular belief, while another believer has this particular belief. Now, this isn't talking about doctrine. This is not talking about doctrine. This isn't talking about what is clearly spoken about in the Word of God. This is talking about doubtful disputations. What it says in verse number 1, are debatable items. Y'all with me? Y'all still with me? Amen. A couple of y'all are. Good. The Word of God is not debatable. When it's in black and white, there's nothing to debate. But personal convictions are. But what is happening in our passage is one brother believes he can eat all things. He can eat pork. He can eat chicken. He can eat shrimp. He can eat mashed potatoes. He can have macaroni and cheese. They have macaroni and cheese back then? I don't know, but it's good. While another only eats herbs. He's, he's a herbivore. He's a vegetarian. Okay? Well, the eat everything guy thinks the vegetarian is crazy and is not right with God. He's being a legalist. While the vegetarian thinks the eat everything guy is a liberal. That's what's happening here. Understand this, both of these people are brothers. The Bible says Christ is accepted on both. They're both brothers. They're believers. They both love God. They both want to serve God. But they see this issue of meat offered unto idols in a different light. Now what's the issue? What, what is the whole deal? What, what, was the, what was the problem in that day with meat being offered unto idols? Well, Paul is writing to some people who are Gentiles, okay? They're Gentiles, and before they were saved... 
they were idolaters. They were idol worshipers, okay? And they sacrificed meat, they sacrificed animals to these idols. And so now, they want nothing to do with anything associated with that former lifestyle. If they see it, they don't get away from me, you're not right with God if you partake in that. They want nothing to do with that former lifestyle. But there are th these other people according to this passage, are not only going to eat meat offered to idols, they going to, th here's the thing, they're, they're not going to eat meat at all. They're not going to be eating meat at all. Th they're playing it safe. They're staying as far away from it as is possible. So, so they don't want to eat meat offered to idols. They say, we're just fine. No, no more meat. We are, we are super conservative. We're just eating vegetables. I would die, by the way. I w if you're a vegetarian, I'm not, I'm just, I would die. Okay, I couldn't. I'm a meat eater. I don't like vegetables. I don't. I'm a carnivore. Amen. Now, that's what I am. I I'm going to die when I'm 50 if I don't start eating them. But here's the thing. Here's, I, I, don't, I don't like vegetables. I don't. But back on subject here. And so here, here's, let's say this. On the other hand, he, he's, writing, he's, writing to, he's writing to Gentiles who used to be idol worshippers. But now he's writing to Jews who have, who have as a result of the gospel been shown that they have the liberty to eat all meats, even meats offered unto idols. And so let's say you have two believers in one church. This guy hates anything associated with idolatry, but this Jew knows that the idols aren't real anyway. There's no such thing as them. And it's just meat. And he doesn't see the big deal, so he just eats. Meat's cheaper anyway, because nobody else will buy it. So in a sense, the, the Gentile is looking at the Jew as a liberal, which is kind of interesting. And the Jew is looking at the Gentile as a legalist. That's what's happening here. Then there was the issue of days that's talked about here. Some people thought you should worship on the Sabbath day. Others thought you should worship on the Lord's day. That was an issue they were having. But notice what Paul says in verse number 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. There are Christians today who feel that Christmas and Easter are pagan holidays. You've, you've heard that and should not be acknowledged. You shouldn't even recognize Christmas. But start about the Catholics, it's just it's, it's a wrong, we shouldn't even bother with it. Many people believe that. Easter is the same way. Don't even acknowledge Easter. There are others who feel there's nothing wrong with celebrating Easter and Christmas. They said, as long as the Lord's honored, that's fine. There's different people, different ways with that. But the key to all of this is found at the end of verse number 5. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. That's the key here. Whatever I believe, whatever it is, I need to be fully persuaded that it's the right thing for me to do. I cannot sin against my conscience. Understand that. Don't sin against your conscience. In other words, I can't live a certain way because somebody else wants me to live that way. Are you all with me? And I, I, please don't take this in the wrong way. Please, I, I don't want to say this, I, but I, I don't live for you. Amen. Please, don't. I, I love y'all guys. I do, but but I, I don't. I don't live for you. I don't answer to you. I didn't get no amens there. I mean, but I, I don't. I, amen. It's true. In verse three, Paul says that the one that eateth not should not judge the one that eateth. Why? Because God has received him. In verse 4 he says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? Seven different times in this passage, Paul says, To the Lord, or unto the Lord. We live for the Lord. We answer to the Lord. Verse number 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. How many of you ever heard of the term Baptist distinctives? A couple of Baptist distinctives, okay? The I in Baptist distinctives is individual soul liberty, okay? Baptists have, have, have historically believed in individual soul liberty. In other words, one day we are going to give an account to God for our own lives and for our own decisions. If you are saved tonight, you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And your main focus, understand this, your main focus needs to be on cultivating that relationship and strengthening that relationship between you and the Lord. That should be your main focus. But far... 
This, I hope I'm, I, don't, I might lose some of y'all right here. Bear with me. Far too many Christians, they never study the Bible themselves. They never read the Bible themselves. They, please, I don't want y'all to take this the wrong way. And I, I, th- I know Brother Cox would agree with me on this. But they focus more on the relationship with their pastor or their favorite preacher. And their beliefs are dictated by, well, my pastor said this or my preacher said this. I can tell you right now, Brother Cox don't want you to believe something because he believes it. He wants you to believe something because the Bible teaches it. But many people, they don't know what the Bible says about stuff because they never read it, they never pray, they never study. They don't know. They just do what they, they, they do what they've always heard. Amen. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 17, to obey them that have the rule over you. That's a favorite verse among many preachers. But that doesn't mean that a pastor or a preacher becomes your mediator between you and God. There is one mediator between you and God, and that's the man Christ Jesus. That's, that's it. But that's what so many do. They judge others who do things differently than them, even though Paul condemns that in Romans chapter number 14. Is that in the Bible right there? Did y'all, did y'all see that? Or am I just missing something here? Here's the mindset. Here's the mindset. They don't agree with my conviction, so that means they're not right with God. They do things differently than me, so they're compromising. May I ask what it is they're compromising? Scripture, you, or your favorite preacher? Amen. I don't think I'd give me amens right there, but I mean, I just, I'm just being real with you. What are they compromising? Are they compromising your opinion, or are they compromising black and white in the Scripture? quiet. The mindset is this. They don't live up to my standards or my convictions so they're not right with God. Our standards are not the measuring stick. For godliness, the scriptures are the measuring stick for godliness. Listen, understand this. There's always going to be someone with higher standards than you. And there's always going to be someone with lower standards than you. And if, if you were someone with higher standards and you look down on someone with lower standards, there are people with higher standards than you who look down on you because you have lower standards. Are you, what makes you right and them wrong? What makes your standards, you, you kind of right here, what makes your standards right and theirs wrong? We'll talk a couple, give you a couple of illustrations on this. All right, bear with me. Okay, many people. And, I, hey, I agree with modesty. Amen. The Bible teaches modesty. Amen. The Bible teaches that. Some people say skirts should be at the knee. Some people say believe skirts should be at the calf or dresses. Some believe, you really come to early America, if you wore your dress or your skirt at the calf, you were considered compromising. At the knee, you were considered compromising. But many today who who say, well, man, it's not, it, it, it's, that thing's at the knee, you know, that thing's, that's, that's way, that's way too short. It should be at the calf. But, but what about the people who say yours should be at the ankle? Are y'all with me? Who's right and who's wrong? Amen. Stay in. Just saying. There's many. There's many other things we could talk about. Uh, by the way, some believe there should be no color. They live in Pennsylvania up there. They're Amish. You know, they they have they have. Are they right? How far do we go? Should should we should we practice modesty? Absolutely, absolutely. But just because somebody may be a little different than you on that doesn't mean they're compromised. It doesn't mean they're not right with God. Some people believe you shouldn't go to the movies, but when it comes out on the TV, you can watch it on TV. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Some people believe you, you can go to the movies. You know, if it's R-rated, you, you can go, you go PG-13. Some PG. Some people say it's got to be Disney. Or it's got to, it's got to be something else. It's got to be, it's got, maybe it can't have certain language and it can't have immorality in it. There's many different beliefs on that. People, some people don't believe in TVs at all. There's many, some people believe that there's no, don't believe in any form of entertainment. They don't laugh. They don't believe in laughter. They believe in frowning. It makes them more sanctified. They're more godly. Man, that's rough. 
But there's, understand this, there's always someone with higher standards than you, and there's always someone with lower standards than you. What makes you right and what makes them wrong? Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Verse number 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. What judgment seat are we going to stand before? The judgment seat of Christ. And after that, and that that'll be after we die. So if every believer will, will, will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, by the way, that shouldn't be something we take lightly. I've, back on that judgment thing, I've heard people say, only God can judge me. That's not going to be pleasant. You would much rather me judge you than God judge you. That's not, the beam of seat is not going to be pleasant. The judgment seat of Christ is not going to be pleasant. He knows far more than I do. He knows far more than that person does. He knows every, he knows every thought that's went through our minds, folks. He knows our motivations. So here's the thing. If every believer will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, then there's no, there's no reason, or there's no need for them to appear at your judgment seat before you. Amen. Judge righteous judgment. If the Bible says it's a sin, listen to this, folks, it's a sin. It was a sin in 1642. Is that when Columbus sailed the ocean blue? 14, one of them. See, 1492, right. Thank you, Wes. 1492. It was, it was, if it was a sin in Columbus today, it's a sin today. It hadn't changed. The Word of God hasn't changed. But the sins that I must focus on more than anyone else's are my own sins. i got a lot of growing to do, folks. I ain't got time to spend all my energy and all my focus on you when I come in the house of God. I need to focus on myself. I need God to work in my own heart. And lastly, I don't need to judge those who see the non-essentials in a different light than me. You say, what's the non-essentials? It's the thing that God doesn't mention in Scripture. If God doesn't mention it, why? what gives me the power to mention it all the time? Why do I preach more on that than I do the things He actually says? Amen. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Jake, I'm going to ask Jacob to become the piano this evening. I want to ask you a question tonight. Are you spending much time on your own heart? Because there'll never be a time when you have to when you have to stop spending time on it. How are you looking at others? Are you a critic? Do you have a critical spirit when it comes to everyone else and everything else they do? Is that you? Maybe you're here tonight and you this is the first time you ever heard that you should judge you should judge sin. Because here's the thing: you're not the ultimate judge on that. God is. God's the one that said that's a sin. So you can, you just you just read you just reading the order you just reading what he's already said he's already thrown down the gavel it's a sin where are you at this evening?